Hi guys, it's Jess from Honest Fiction and welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I'm going to be recapping everything that went down in Crescent City 2, House of Sky and Breath, in preparation for Crescent City 3, House of Flame and Shadow. All right, guys, so before we jump into the recap, I do want to say that this should not be watched in lieu of actually reading House of Sky and Breath. This is more for people that read House of Sky and Breath when it first came out and don't have time to do a reread before House of Flame and Shadow releases. Now, I do have a full recap video for the first book in the Crescent City series, House of Earth and Blood, and I will leave that in the cards and the description. Definitely check that out because I'm pretty much going to pick up right where that book left off. And if you're unfamiliar with my channel, I post new videos every Wednesday and Sunday. If you haven't yet, please like and subscribe. You can also hit that notification bell to be notified whenever I post new bookish content. You can also check out my Instagram, Goodreads, and Patreon, all linked down below. With all that out of the way, let's talk about Crescent City, House of Sky and Breath. All right, guys, so jumping into the prologue, we are introduced to Sophie Renast. We do not know very much about Sophie at all. All we know is she is searching for her brother in a Kavalan death camp. Now, she is able to find her brother, Emil, along with some other children, and she is determined to get them to safety. Now, Sophie is working with the Orphean rebel group, who I mentioned in a previous video, is comprised of humans that are trying to go up against the Veneer and the Asteri. Now, Orphean is being led by Pippa Spetsos, and the only reason Pippa is willing to help Sophie is because Pippa believes that Sophie has information that could help take down the Astari. So anyway, like I said, Sophie ends up finding Emil and some other children that are being held in the staff camp and is trying to get them to safety. She ends up running into Agent Silverbow. We don't know who he actually is. We just know his code name. However, we do know that he is working for the Orphean Rebels. So together, they are trying to take these children to safety. They are being chased by these shifters. And we find out that Sophie is actually part Thunderbird. Now, it has long been believed that the Thunderbirds were wiped out previously because they had such strong power and could go up against the Asteri. However, it turns out that Pep, or Sophie and her family have really just kind of kept under the radar and they do possess the Thunderbird ability. So anyway, Agent Silverbow and the children are able to escape. However, Sophie Renast is captured by the Hind. Now, the Hind we were met in the first book, Crescent City, House of Earth and Blood. She was part of Sandriel's Kajari, and she is like a super spy master, really evil, known for torture. She's dating Pollux, who is also in the Kajari, who's also super evil. Anyway, the Hind, also known as Lydia, is her real name, finds Sophie and then essentially drowns her to death after kind of not really torturing her for information. You would think she would torture her a little bit more, but kind of questions her a little bit, decides she doesn't have any information they can use, and then kills Sophie Renast. So that is where the prologue leaves off. There was so many unanswered questions. We had not met most of these characters up to this point. So I was very confused. And I'm gonna be honest, I completely forgot about this entire like plot element when I was doing my reread of this book. All right, guys, so after the prologue, we are back with the characters that we know and love. So it has been three months since the attack on Crescent City, and Bryce is now working at the Fae Archives. Hunt is now a free angel slash Malakim, and he is still working at the 33rd under Isaiah. Now, Juniper and Fury Axtar have now moved in together. They are officially in a relationship, and everything seems to be going pretty well. I do want to point out that in the first chapter, Ember, Bryce's mom, and Bryce see, I believe, a sculpture or a painting, and it is showing how the first Star Sword was created. However, the person that is creating the Star Sword looks a lot like Hunt, and Ember and Bryce both note that. I just want to say that because I feel like it's going to be very relevant in another book, only because I feel like there's no other reason to have that pointed out so early in this book. And I believe it is either going to be Hunt's father or some sort of ancestor that created the first Star Sword. Anyway, so all of our favorite characters are going to see Juniper perform at this ballet. Now, we find out that the Fae are kind of angry with Bryce because she has shown that she is starborn. She has this star power, which she showed at the end of the last book, and she has this star on her chest. And for some reason, she can't really control when it lights up. So she gets very embarrassed at the show, at Juniper's show, because the entire place goes dark and her chest is just lighting up. 
and then Hunt ends up covering it. It's a really cute moment. We also find out that Bryce and Hunt have decided not to be intimate until winter solstice. I don't know why Bryce attempts to say it's because they both went through a lot of trauma and they want to get to know each other and not rush into things. Seems like a huge waste to me, but personally, that is what they are dealing with. So they obviously both really, really want to sleep together, but they are trying just to hold off until winter solstice. Now, after all of that takes place at Juniper's recital, they then go to Rune's house and he is having a party. All right, like I said, this party is taking place at Rune's house, which is essentially like a college frat house. We get that scene of Rune like going down on the fawn. He also is dealing with the fact that he is supposed to marry the witch Hypaxia and they have not seen each other in a decent amount of time and he doesn't know if him doing this and messing around with the fawn is going to essentially hurt her feelings and if she's sleeping around or like what's going on. So he's kind of dealing with some complicated emotions. Now, while he's kind of grappling with that, they are alerted to a presence. Now this presence ends up being a fae. The fae is named Cormac and he has showed up uninvited to this party to meet his future intended bride, Bryce Quinlan. Now Bryce does not recognize this person, however Rune does. And Rune realizes that it is Bryce and Rune's cousin. Now his father is the king of the Albaran fae, which is different than the fae from the Autumn Court, because Bryce's father is the king of the Autumn Fae, or the Autumn Court, and then Velbart, you know what I mean. So anyway, their fathers have arranged that Cormac will marry Bryce. Now Bryce obviously is in love with Hunt, so she's like, no thank you. Cormac says, uh, you don't really have a choice, this is gonna happen with or without you wanting to do it. And they almost come to blows, but then they end up separating. So we also find out that Rune doesn't like Cormac, and all of Rune's friends don't like Cormac because there is a ritual that took place where, very similar to the Illyrians, how they have to go up this mountain and like fight each other to the death in order to get their ciphers. Same thing Rune had to do, but he had to get the Star Sword. So he was going up against Cormac, Cormac almost killed him and his friends, yada yada yada, they have history, they hate each other. So Bryce and Hunt end up leaving this party, they're kind of upset over everything that's going on, and when they get there, they see Ethan Holstrom. Just a bloody mess outside Bryce's apartment. Now, who is Ethan Holstrom? He was Connor Holstrom's brother, one of Danica's pack of devils who was killed when all of that went down in the first Crescent City book. So Bryce has not really talked to Ethan since he helped her at the end of Crescent City 1 and is wondering why there is just a shifter bloody in her apartment. So we find out that it was actually Sabine who attacked Ethan. Now, Sabine is Danica's mother and the current leader of the Pack of Devils. Now, there's also an alpha wolf who's like really the leader, but Sabine is really the one that's running the show. And she has decided that since Ethan helped Bryce at the end of book one and also talked bad about Sabine in the media, that he was out of the pack. So they attacked essentially attacked him, almost killed him, and then one of the nicer wolves dropped Ethan off at Bryce's apartment because Bryce is really the only person Ethan has in the world at the moment since his brother has been killed, his pack has abandoned him, and Bryce is Bryce and just loves everybody. So Ethan is now staying with Bryce and they end up discussing what happened at the end of Crescent City 1. Bryce says that Danica actually bought her time in order for her to like make the jump back up to Earth and that the pack of devils are like happy in the bone quarter and they're just like living the good life. And Ethan is like, I really hope so. Like, I love Connor, you know, Connor loved you. He thought you might be his mate. And then we talk about what mates are, very similar to what mates are like in Akatar. your one true love. They're supposed to be very rare, but they seem to pop up everywhere in SJM's universe. Um, I'm sorry, I'm very frustrated by that. But anyway, that is pretty much what we get from Ethan. And now we're gonna go to Therian, because he has been doing his own stuff going during all of this. So if you don't remember Therian, we met him in book one, House of Earth and Blood, and he is a mare, he lives underwater, and he actually helped out Bryce and Hunt at the end of the other book. So we find out that he actually slept with the River Queen's virgin daughter and promised himself to her, and now he pretty much has to do everything the River Queen says. He really does not want to marry this girl, however, because he promised this and he is not as powerful as the River Queen. He has no choice. Now, the River Queen has told him that she needs him to find Sophie Renas' body. Now, do you remember Sophie Renas? She was from the prologue, the hind drowned her, 
and her body is presumably just left in the water. So he, Therian, is trying to find Sophie Renau's body. Now, when he gets to where her body should be, he realizes that the chains have been broken and her body is not there. So this makes him and the River Queen very curious, and she sends him on a mission to try to find Sophie Renas's body and or is she alive? So at some point, Therian also finds out about Emile, Sophie's brother, who has escaped and the River Queen wants Therian to find not only Sophie, but also Emile. So Therian ends up going to Bryce and Hunt and that is really where our plot starts to get going. So Therian ends up hacking in to Sophie Renas's email accounts and finds out that she was actually in cahoots with Danica. Now, I will say my biggest takeaway from this book as a whole is, did Bryce even know Danica? Like, were they even friends? Because it seems like this girl had an entirely separate life away from Bryce. I just, I want to know how this works because I don't think they spent any time together. Anyway, so Therian finds out that Sophie Renas was actually working with Danica and it was Project Dusk's Truth, and Danica was telling Sophie of a safe place for her and Emile to hide. Now, Therian realizes that Bryce obviously was supposedly really close with, so with Danica, and goes to Bryce and Hunt and explains the situation, saying, hey, I am looking for this girl. I believe she knew Danica. Is there any possibility? Are you familiar with this name? Now, Bryce is once again very sad that she apparently did not know her best friend at all and says, I have not heard of this. I don't think that Danica was working with the Orphean Rebels. Well, it turns out Danica definitely was working with the Orphean Rebels, or at least to some extent. During all of this, we also find out that Danica is actually a bloodhound, and she's able to sniff out bloodlines and kind of determine if people are related or almost their like ancestry. She just has like a really good sense of smell. So they believe that she got this from her father. Now, no one knows who Danica's father is, or at least we don't believe anyone knows, but she had this gift. And that means that Danica probably realized that Sophie was a Thunderbird before anybody else. And it was probably why she was willing to work with Sophie so quickly. So then when Bryce realizes that there is a little boy that all of these people are searching for. She becomes very worried because she realizes that everyone is searching for this boy for his power. So we have Pippa searching for the boy, the River Queen searching for the boy, and probably the Asteri searching for this boy, all because they want to use his Thunderbird gifts, and no one cares that this is just a scared little boy that is running for his life. So Bryce decides she wants to help find this kid. Now Hunt is like, let's stay out of this because we are already on the Asteri's radar. On top of all of that, Hunt has a new boss. So if you remember, at the end of Crescent City 1, Micah was killed by Bryce and then she vacuumed up his corpse. So they need a new archangel to lead the 33rd. So the Asteri have Celestina, who is an archangel that no one knows very much about, come to the city and that will now be Hunt and Isaiah and the rest of the 33rds like main primary boss. So she also brings some people with her, one of them being Pollux, who, like I said, is the Heinz kind of like boyfriend, but he's also like the most evil, disgusting being on the planet. I believe he is also Malachim, so he has the angel wings. And then the Hellhound, which is a shifter who is also Malachim. I forget his name. I will leave it on the screen and I'll say it again later. Um, and he brings that Kajari into the 33rd. So not only does he have to worry about the Asteri, he now has to worry about Celestina, and Pollux and the Hellhound and all of these people possibly finding out what him and Bryce are up to. So this causes a little bit of a rift between Hunt and Bryce because Bryce really wants to do the right thing and help this little boy and Hunt is like, I just don't want us getting killed and our friends being in danger. So that is pretty much where we leave off in that part of the book. All right, guys, so before I continue with the plot, I wanna go over some of these characters. If you feel like you don't need this, then definitely skip to the next timestamp. So first we're introduced to Celestina. She is the new archangel in charge of the 33rd, replacing Micah. So far, no one really has any issues with her, but they don't know what her motivations are either. She also has brought Baxian, who is the Hellhound. Now he was part of Sandriel's Kajari, Sandriel being the archangel that owned Hunt back in Pangea. Now, Baxian is known as being very cruel. Everyone in the Kajari was very cruel, minus Hunt. However, he seems to have turned over a new leaf. We don't know if he is doing this in order to trap Hunt and friends, or if he really is trying to assimilate into Crescent City. Then there is the Hammer Pollux, worst dude ever, just know that, hate him, he's horrible. 
He's also part of Sandriel's Kajari that has now been brought over to help Celestina in the 33rd by the Asteri. So then we have Therion. We met him in the previous book. However, we get a lot more of him in this book. He is a mare, which means he has to touch water um, every, I forget how many hours or so, or else he will lose his fins, which is like the worst fate imaginable. Now he is supposed to marry the River Queen's daughter because he took her virginity despite the fact he does not want to marry her. He actually likes being on the outside land, which is something that most mares do not enjoy doing. So he is essentially like her, the River Queen's almost like spy. Like he is going out searching for people. He is currently searching for Emile and Sophie. Then we have Brace and Hunt. I feel like you guys already probably have a good grasp of them. Then we have Ethan. He is a shifter that was part of Sabine's pack. However, after he helped Bryce at the end of Crescent City 1, he was thrown out of the pack by Sabine and is currently living with Bryce and Hunt. And then you have Fury and Juniper. You guys already know about them. Just know that Fury is also part of House of, I believe, Flame and Shadow and is a crazy good assassin. So that is pretty much all of the characters that we have seen. And then we also have Cormac, who is a fae that Rune and all of his friends despise because Cormac and his friends almost killed him during these trials that took place, I think, over 100 years ago because Rune was only like 27 or 28 when these trials took place. And during those trials is when Rune got the Star Sword and Bryce is supposed to marry Cormac. However, she does not want to do this because she loves Hunt. So that is pretty much where we're at with all of the characters. Hope you guys are following. I know this is very chaotic and I apologize. And moving on, so Bryce ends up meeting up with Rune and they discuss how Danica was a bloodhound and it's possible that she knew information and that's what got her killed uh, on top of everything that went down in Crescent City. So then they return to Bryce's apartment only to be met with the Prince of the Chasm, Adius, one of the demons of hell. Now, Adius kind of helped out Bryce in the last book, so she's kind of chill with him. However, everyone else is scared out of their minds because a Prince of Hell just showed up in Bryce's apartment. Now, this prince can also turn into a cat. I don't know if that's gonna be relevant, but just so you know. So anyway, the prince tells Bryce that he need, she needs to learn how to use her power because she has power that is similar to Princess Thea. I am gonna go over this history of the Prince Thea, the seven uh, princes of hell, all of that at the end of this video. It is too complicated to do it in the middle of this plot. So anyway, tells her this history and says she needs to learn to fight to harness this power. Now, when he leaves, it turns out that he actually broke the wards and Cormac overheard the entire thing and is like, what are you guys doing? Turns out Cormac is actually Agent Silverbow from the prologue and he was in love with Sophie Renast. He does not want to marry Bryce. He actually wants to find Sophie because he loved her. So Cormac, Rune, Bryce, all of them decide they're going to work together and they are going to figure out what Danica was trying to discover. They're also going to find Emil, Sophie's brother, because Cormac believes that he needs to find this boy to honor Sophie. And also we find out that Cormac is working with the Orphean rebels because he doesn't like the way that the humans are being treated. And that's pretty much where all of that leaves off. So Cormac asks Rune if Rune can help with the Orphean rebels, although Rune is very much against helping this group because Pippa Spetsos is a crazy lady, um, because Rune has the ability to talk mind to mind, which I believe is the Damati ability that we learned about in Akhtar, I'm not positive. But they have these stones that if you're able to have this power, you can talk to someone via a stone that they have. So there is an agent, Agent Daybright, who has been feeding Sophie information. Well, Sophie's dead and she can't use these stones. So Cormac asks Rune if he would be willing to talk to Agent Daybright and help with their efforts to stop the Asteri. And Rune reluctantly agrees. So some other things that are going on while all of this is taking place is Bryce and Hunt have decided that they are not going to wait until winter solstice to do the deed. So they end up messing around and Ethan ends up hearing them. So shortly after this, Ethan ends up moving in with Rune and his friends, despite the fact that one's a shifter, one's a fae, or the rest are fae. Um, they actually have this like really cute friend group going on. So they all end up living together, which is great for Hunt and Bryce who now have some privacy. Now, one day after Hunt and Bryce are messing around, Hunt wakes up and he's actually been captured by Apollyon, the Prince of the Pit. Now, it's more like a dream state and Apollyon actually refers to it as being a in-between space, which reminded me of Akatar when Tamlin was able to get rid of a chair and Pharaoh's like, where did the chair go? 
And Tamlin's like, it's in a space between worlds. So it kind of reminded me of that. I don't know if that's gonna be important. But anyway, Apollyon asks Hunt why he's not using his powers to escape and says that Bryce and Hunt's powers are actually very similar and also gives them a little bit of history, which once again, I will say at the end of this video. So that is all kind of going on. We also have Therian who is still searching for Emil and Sophie. And we find out that Danica was actually a history major while she was in college and was searching all of this stuff that could be very dangerous. So before Ethan actually moved out of Bryce's apartment, he was messing around with the star sword, ends up breaking Danica's table in half, and they find all of these papers that are about the history of bloodlines and the Astari and where the first shifters came from in the first bay. And it looked like Danica was doing a ton of research. Once again, the fact that her best friend knew nothing of this just amazes me. But anyway, they realize that Danica might have told Sophie to hide in the bone quarter, and that is their next place to go. Now, before they can get there, Rune and Bryce are walking, I believe, to visit Cormac when Rune hears Agent Daybright in his head. Now, he's not holding the crystal. There's no reason for him to hear her, but she essentially says something like, watch out, or something to that extent. Now, right after that, Rune is attacked by a Reaper, a Reaper being exactly what you would think a Reaper would be, one of those, like, creepy Reaper-type beings that have no souls, they're immortal, and they're just horrible. Think Dementor. Anyway... They end up taking Rune into the sewer and Bryce gives chase. And when she gets down there, the Reaper says, hey, you need to learn to fight. The Prince of the Pit, Apollyon, is coming and he's gonna bring all these people from hell and you need to like get your shit together. So Bryce is about to use her starlight. However, she's afraid that these Reapers are going to drop Rune and he is going to plummet to his death into this like watery abyss. So Cormac ends up showing up and he winnows, I believe, they say he teleports. I'm pretty sure it's winnowing and is able to help Bryce, gives her the star sword that Rune was carrying, and she is able to kill the Reapers, and they make it out alive. Now, because the Reapers were the ones that attacked them, they think the Underking might be the one that sent the Reapers, although the Reapers literally said Apollyon. Like, I, I don't really know where their thought process went there, but they end up deciding they have to go to the Underking, which is also where the Bone Quarter is, to see what is actually going on. Is Connor and the rest of the pack of devils actually safe, like they heard he was, and like what's actually going down? Also, I would like to note that the fact that Agent Daylight, who we're gonna find out exactly who she is, was able to talk to Rune mind to mind without that crystal or anything, I'm like 99.9% .9 sure they're mates. It's never said in this book, but like I think that's the only reason why that connection was able to happen. I'm pretty sure they're mates and it was like a fair Rusan situation. So after all of that went down, Rune ended up going to his father, the Autumn King, and asked why the Starborn Sword was able to kill the Reapers since they are unkillable. The Autumn King explains that the Starborn Sword is actually from a meteorite and if it is wielded by the Starborn Air, it is unbelievably powerful. That's why people kill for it. So then after that, Bryce and Hunt decide that they need to go to the Bone Quarter to see exactly what's going on, if Connor is there, and also is Emil hiding out there, since it seems like Danica might have told Sophie that that would be a safe place for her and Emil to hide, despite the fact that that's where all of the souls and the Underking lives, and it's horrible. So in order to get to the Bone Quarter, Hunt and Bryce need death marks. So they ask Jessaba, Jessaba being a witch who was once... Bryce's boss and say, hey, do you have death marks we can buy? I'll owe you a favor. Jespa says, yes, I do. And also kind of gives some information about Danica saying that there was a reason Danica was always hanging out by the antiquity area um, or the antiquity shop that Bryce used to work in. So once again, Bryce just did not know this girl at all. So anyway, they end up going to the bone quarter, but before they get there, Hunt runs in to the hellhound Baxian. And like I said, Baxian's kind of trying to turn over a new leaf. And he's like, hey, I wouldn't do that. You're gonna die. And Bryce and Hunt are like, we're gonna take that risk. So they end up leaving and going to the Bone Quarter. Now Bryce does have the star sword that Rune gave her because Rune's like, hey, if you're gonna do this dangerous thing, uh, probably take this protection. So they get to the Bone Quarter and that is where some big revelations take place. We find out that the souls are not just happy and chilling in this bone quarter, they are actually fed to the gate as second light. So your souls are actually taken when you die and they chill out in the bone quarter for a little bit, living a good life until all of your relatives have forgotten about you and then they are given over to these gates and turned into second light to help power the city. They also are fed from, from the Underking and also from the Asteri. So people are essentially just being fed from all the time and it's horrible and Bryce 
And Hunt are like, oh God, why did you tell us this information? And then Hunt goes, oh, it's because he doesn't expect us to live and make it out of here. So they are able to live because they're badasses. And Bryce or Hunt is somehow able to use his magic to put it into Bryce. So he essentially sends his thunder magic into Bryce, pumps her up, and she's able to use her power in order to escape. But now they know that Connor and the Pack of Devils are probably going to be turned into gate food relatively soon, and also all of the people of Lunathian have no idea that they're actually kind of like cattle and the Asari and the gates themselves are just feeding off of them. While Hunt and Bryce are fighting for their lives in the Bone Quarter, and I would like to point out that the Underking does say he is not the one who sent the Reapers, so we still don't know who sent the Reapers that attacked Rune and Bryce, um, there is a lot of other stuff going on. So we see Ethan, Rune, and Cormac, and they're kind of having a discussion about the Agent Daybright, and then also the Orphean Rebellion, and they're trying to figure things out. And then they see big, scary Murdoch. So Murdoch is actually a dread wolf, and he is a bloodhound. He is also Danica's father, and is right under the hind. Now, something I did not mention earlier, which I really wish I did, is the fact that Celestina, the head of the 33rd at the moment, the Archangel that replaced Micah, because of something that happened, she is now being forced to marry Ephraim, who is another Archangel that was all the way in Pangea. Now, Ephraim ends up coming to Crescent City and he brings with him Lydia the Hind, also the Harpy, and also the, and also Mordok. So he brings all of them back to Crescent City. So now we have pretty much all of Sandriel's Kajari in one area, which is not good. But like I said, Baxian, the Hellhound, is kind of trying to turn over a new leaf. And also there might be some things going on with the Hind. So anyway, while Ethan, Cormac, and Rune are having this discussion, they are smelled by Mordok. Now they're in an area they are not supposed to be, and they are very worried because if Mordok scents them, they are screwed. Like I said, he's a bloodhound. He has those crazy abilities where like one scent, he knows who you are. So they are able to escape, but just barely. And there is the possibility that Mordok was able to scent them. So after escaping Mordok, Ethan and Rune hide out in this bar and they are approached by the Hind. So the Hind ends up playing cards with Rune and essentially says that she has all of this information on them, which is very concerning because she is the Asteri spy master. And we also find out that Lydia, also known as the Hind, is the half-sister of Hypaxia. Who is Hypaxia? She is the witch that Rune is supposed to marry. She's kind of like the queen of the witches. So we find out that Hypaxia's mother had Lydia the Hind. However, Lydia didn't have any sort of witch abilities. So she was given over to her father's family, which are like deer shifters. And Hypaxia has the necromancy witch ability. So she was raised by her mother to be the future queen of the witches. However, her mother raised her with dead people who taught her everything. So all the witches are like, we're not really cool with that. So it seems like the witches might be trying to put behind Lydia into power instead of Hypaxia because they don't trust her because she was tutored by dead souls, essentially, is how I'm kind of condensing it. So we find out all of that information. So they eventually leave, they go back to Bryce's apartment, and they are met with Bryce, Hunt, and Therian. So Therian ended up saving Bryce and Hunt from the water after they escaped the Bone Quarter. We also find out that Bryce's ability allows her to almost suck in power like the gates. So she, not like a leech, but kind of, and it has to be pure power. So Hunt's power is the best conductor she has at the moment. Also, while all of this was going down, at some point they confessed their love for each other and decided that they loved each other and were going to consider themselves mates because they were even more, uh, they didn't want to use the term boyfriend-girlfriend. So moving on, Celestina now has to have this public engagement with Ephraim now that all of his people and their people are like in the city. So Celestina asks that Bryce uh, accompany her and just kind of look out for her because she's nervous about this entire thing. It's very obvious she does not want to marry this archangel. However, she has to do it because the Asteri have told her to and she would just like some friends there as backup. Not that they're really friends, but they're like trying to trust each other. So Hunt goes without Bryce, which is kind of bad because Sabine shows up at Bryce's apartment and attempts to threaten Bryce to stay out of wolf business and how dare Bryce harbor Ethan, even though Ethan isn't living there at this point, um, and be like doing anything that involves the wolves because she's not a wolf, she is a fae. So then Ethan essentially tells Sabine, hey, were you gonna tell anyone that Danica's father is the big bag Murdoch? 
and why are you keeping that so close to the chest? There's a whole altercation, and then Bryce ends up texting Hunt and is like, Sabine is here. So Hunt deserts the party he is supposed to be at with Celestina, his boss, and goes to Bryce's apartment. Now, Baxian, the hellhound, sees him leaving and decides to follow him, which ends up being good because Baxian kind of saves the day during this altercation. So Celestina clocks the fact that Hunt left and is very hurt by this and decides to punish him by making him stay at their like barracks for two weeks instead of staying with Bryce, which they are very upset about because they have now told each other that they love each other and they wanna have spicy time and they can no longer do this. So that is all going on. Now, while this is happening, Ethan is still very upset at the fact that he just found out that his brother, Soul, is gonna be Gate, Asteri, or Under King Food and wants to find out if, is Connor's soul even there? Like, can we trust these people? Because they've lied to us this whole time. So eventually they find out about these mystics. And we're gonna get into that. So Theria and Ethan and Bryce all go to the astronomer. The astronomer is a person who has these mystics that are able to go into different realms and answer questions. Mystics, if anyone has seen Minority Report, same kind of vibe. We have these people that have been kept in this almost like sensory deprivation type chambers. Um, I guess not really because they're able to see, but they're just like floating in water and they're able to like go into different realms and it's a pretty terrible, horrible life. But anyway, the astronomer has these essential slaves in these tanks and Ethan asks one of them or asks them if they will be willing to go into hell to see if that's where Connor is because he just wants to make sure his brother's soul has not been eaten. So on top of this, the astronomer also has these rings and in these rings are fire sprites like Lahaba, RIP, favorite character from the last book that he has enslaved in these rings. So Bryce clocks that and is like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm letting this person keep these fire sprites enslaved, but like I can't do anything about it. So Ethan is still very upset and they decide they're gonna do this ritual and try to contact Hell. So one of the mystics actually does make it down to Hell where he meets the Prince of the Ravine who seems like a total dick. And he says that Connor's soul is not here but then proceeds to eat the soul of the mystic who made it down to Hell. So then the astronomer is like, oh my gosh, you just killed my mystic. Oh God, I hate you guys. So they end up leaving. However, Ethan sees this girl mystic, pulls her out of the tank, and she just says, I want to go back, let me go back, I want to go back. And the astronomer says, she can't live outside in this world, you have to let her go back. So Ethan begrudgingly agrees, and they leave the astronomer with more questions than answers. So then shortly after this, Ethan ends up meeting with the prime, or like the alpha of the werewolf pack, the one above Sabim that doesn't really do much anymore. And he tells Ethan that if Ethan wants to, he can become an alpha of his own pack. Now, Ethan isn't sure if he wants to do this. He really looked up to his brother Connor and he's just not sure if he's ready to start a pack. However, he doesn't want Sabine to rule because she is the worst. So he decides he is going to go back to the astronomer to see if he can get some more answers. Well, when he gets there, it turns out the astronomer is off looking for a part to fix his big machine tank thing. And the female mystic is out of the tank. So Ethan ends up getting a whiff of this female, realizes she's a wolf, not just any wolf, she's probably an alpha wolf. She has no history or no memory of her past and she is just accepted being in this tank. And Ethan is like, hey, you need to get out of here. I can't just abandon a wolf. And she's like, well, you have to because I sold or I was sold to feed my family. And if I leave, then my family is gonna die. So Ethan's very upset by this, and instead of freeing her, he decides, hey, I might as well steal something, and he takes all of the rings that have the fire sprites in them and takes them back to Rune's house. So he gets back to Rune's house, and him and then Felix and all of Rune's friends that are also Faye decide to open the rings and out pop a bunch of adorable little fire sprites and a dragon shifter named Ariadne. So then while Ethan and all of Rune's friends are trying to figure out what they're going to do with all of the fire sprites and the dragon shifter that Ethan has just stolen, there is Rune, Therian, Hunt, and Bryce. And they have gotten some indel from Agent Daybright that says that the Orphean rebels are about to get this crate of really dangerous weapons. Or somehow the Orphean rebels have these very dangerous weapons. So Hunt and the gang, Bryce, everyone I mentioned, all go to these underwater caves where they meet up with Pippa, who shows them this machine that is able to suck power, that is a big theme throughout this book, suck power into it and like expel it as a major weapon. 
Now, Hunt realizes that this weapon is going to kill millions of Veneer, um, and possibly humans, and the entire group decide that they're just going to blow it up because hell yeah. So they blow up all of these weapons. Pippa and the Orphean rebels are obviously really pissed about this and try to kill them. So they are able to escape. However, they see Braxian, the hellhound, on the shore warning them and barking and like trying to get their attention. Turns out the hind is tailing them on a ship and it's going to catch them before they're able to make it to shore. So they're trying to figure out what to do because they are on this boat. Hunt can't really use his lightning because he's gonna electrocute everybody. Bryce could blind them, but then they're definitely gonna know who they are chasing because at this point they can't really see them. So the hind is able to pretty much get up to the whole gang, but before she's able to capture them, there's a ship that just comes out of the water and scoops up our friends and then goes back down. So we find out that this ship is actually comprised of another group of underwater people that are not part of the River Queen's people, but another organization, and they offer Therian, the mayor, be like, hey, why don't you like help us work with us and like leave the River Queen? And he's like, nah, she'll kill me if I do that, but thanks for the offer. We also find out that unfortunately, Sophie Renast did pass away and did drown. They weren't able to get her to her in time. However, they did say that they were alerted to the fact that Sophie Renast was being um, kept underwater. So at first, everyone believes that Sophie used some sort of like Thunderbird light and that's how they knew about it, but it turns out that wasn't the case. So anyway, they see, Cormac ends up seeing Sophie Renast's body and Cormac is just devastated and he's holding on to Sophie's uh, hand and then he realizes that she has these runes carved into her arm that she must have carved into her arm prior to dying. Like, and So obviously this is very important if this was her last act on Earth. So anyway, Hunt and Bryce decide that they really love each other. They end up having sex, and when they have sex, it is just so amazing that they teleport. I, I don't know. I don't know what that's going to mean later, but it's just, it's that good. So they end up teleporting. Their magic merges, and now they are actual mates, like real mates. Their scents combine, and that is that. Now, I will say, this is my personal thing, I don't love Hunt as a love interest. I was really hoping that wouldn't be the case. We'll see if it actually plays out. But anyway, so they now are officially mates. Rune is able to smell their like mating bond and everyone's very happy. And unfortunately, Sophie Renast, we now know, is dead. So now Bryce is even more concerned about Emile, but it seems like she might also be hiding something. So the group finally makes it back to Rune's frat house where they discover that Ethan has stolen a bunch of fire sprites and a dragon shifter. Now we also are kind of hinted at the fact that Flynn, one of Rune's friends, might have a crush on the dragon shifter and tells her to just run away. However, the dragon shifter tells him that she can't shift because she has a slave tattoo similar to the one that Hunt had that prevents her from shifting, so she can't run. So Hunt and Bryce end up going to the meat market uh, quarter where they meet up with the Viper Queen and Hunt finds out that Bryce actually enlisted the Viper Queen's help to try to find a meal. It turned out that Danica actually told Sophie to hide with the Viper Queen and that was the safe spot, not the bone quarter. So Bryce has kind of known this the entire time but didn't tell Hunt and Hunt is very, very hurt by this. So then the Viper Queen shows a meal and we get the huge revelation that Emil does not possess a single ounce of Thunderbird power. It was actually all Sophie, and Sophie did it in a way to make it look like it could have been Emil, so that way people would protect Emil. However, Bryce was the only person that saw Emil as a human boy, and that's when Hunt realizes that he was kind of a dick and forgives her. So anyway, Bryce has forged these papers and sends a meal to live with her mother and stepfather back in like the human area, and she sends him with Fury Axtar. All right, guys, we are getting close to the end, I promise. So now that we know Emile is safe, Bryce decides she's not gonna tell the rest of her friends just to make sure that as few people know as possible. So Rune has been having his meetings with Agent Daybright and they've slowly been falling more and more in love and there have been hints to who Daybright actually is. So Daybright and Rune decide that they are gonna meet up in person at Celestina and Ephraim's. They're having some sort of event. So, and the Asteri will also be there. I think it's like their engagement party or something. So they're gonna meet and use the secret code to identify each other and they're finally gonna have this romantic moment. Now, Hypaxia ends up showing up at Rune's house, who I said is the witch who is also Rune's intended future wife. Hypaxia explains to Rune that she thinks that the witches are out to kill her because she was tutored by these dead uh, tutors 
and that they don't trust her and they want to put the hind Lydia in power. So she's afraid that they are going to try to kill her. So she asks Rune if he will send his guards to accompany her to this event. So Rune decides that he is going to ask Ethan to help. This kind of gets them out of some political issues that I didn't really talk about, but not really important. So Ethan is going to help guard uh, Hypaxia, and so is the Dragon Shifter, so that way they can kind of give the Dragon Shifter a reason to be in the city, because Ethan did steal her, so they're trying to ne like negotiate with the astronomer to keep her. So they are both going to go with Hypaxia to this event, and Rune is also going to go and hopefully meet Agent Daybright in the flesh for the first time. Now the Equinox party is really where things start to go down. So the Autumn King, prior to this party, went to Bryce and said, hey, since you have been name dropping that you're the Fae Princess, I am going to legally change your name and you're gonna have to start acting like a princess. Also, you still have to marry Cormac. Now Bryce is like, oh, hell no. And then the Autumn King and her get into this big fight where he tells her she better show up to this party, dress the way he wants and not embarrass her. So Bryce shows up to this party with Cormac However, after the Asteri show up via video call, she says that she is announcing the fact that she is mated with Hunt, and because the Autumn King doesn't like any big scenes, he doesn't do anything. So now Bryce and Hunt are officially mates, and he's actually a fae prince because he is Hunt is dating or mated to Bryce, the fae princess, so everyone has a good laugh at the Autumn King's expense. So also, Celestina is supposed to be with Ephraim, and they are obviously very awkward. You can tell Celestina doesn't really like Ephraim, and we find out exactly why. It is because Celestina has been hooking up with Hypaxia, runes intended, uh, this entire time, and they are actually in a relationship and are probably mates, judging by the way Celestina reacts when Hunt and Bryce catches Hypaxia and Celestina in a closet getting it on. So that is why Celestina has been so, like, kind of awkward around Ephraim, it's because she's in love with Hypaxia. Hypaxia also really doesn't want to marry Rune because it seems like she's in love with Celestina. So we find out all of that. Also, Rune, like I said, was supposed to be meeting with Agent Daybright. However, when he gets to the meeting spot, he sees the harpy and he's like, oh no, she can't be Day. And he tries using the code word. She has no idea what the code word means. However, the hind is right behind her. Hint, hint. So after that, they all go back and they kind of discuss all the revelations of this party. Also, on top of all of this, I'm just going to throw this out here. Braxian, the hellhound, was actually Danica's mate because no one knew anything about what was going on with Danica, apparently. So it turns out that Braxian, the hellhound, is trying to turn over a new leaf uh, because he is actually mates with Danica and was trying to help Danica and Danica was afraid that she was going to pass away and that Sabine was going to stay in control of the wolves. So she was trying to look into the history of all of these different species in order to figure out if there were any other um, options besides Sabine. In doing so, she found out a bunch of stuff she probably shouldn't have found out. And that is why she enlisted Sophie Renas to help her get into a designated area that she could not get into because she was so recognizable. However, Sophie, most people believe it was just a human, would be able to get into these locations. So a few other things I wanna point out that I think might be relevant, but I don't wanna to go too in depth on. So the dragon shifter ends up running away. She was supposed to be a bodyguard. She ends up deserting and goes to the Viper Queen. She asks the Viper Queen if she can be sold into her employment and be a fighter in the pits because being a fighter for the Viper Queen is better than being a slave. And the Viper Queen agrees. Now Flynn, who I said is one of Rune's friends, is very upset by this, but he can't really do anything about it. Also, Therian has decided he does not want to marry the River Queen's daughter, and he actually ends up telling her this because he doesn't want to ruin her life as well. However, she decides she's very upset by this. She already knew he didn't want to marry her, but was hoping that he would change his mind. So she jumps into the water, and Therian believes she is going to go tell her mother, and then he will be forced to marry her and procreate with her. So he does the same thing the Dragon Shifter did, runs to the Viper Queen and says, hey, I would like to sell myself into your employment. Just let me help my friends first before I do that. So the Viper Queen says, okay, but you have to drink some of my blood. Now, I think this is similar to what Maeve does in Throne of Glass. If you've read this series, I'm not going to say any more than that, but I think it's a similar type thing. So Therian drinks the Viper Queen's blood and then immediately feels like he belongs to her. However, she says that he is able to go help his friends. Now, what is he helping his friends do? Well, 
Bryce, Rune, and Hunt, and Cormac, well, not Cormac, Bryce, Rune, and Hunt, Cormac is also kind of doing his own thing, have decided to infiltrate this area that Danica and Sophie had both gone to, and after they saw something on a screen, they looked utterly shocked, and everyone who leaves this room just looks horrified. So Bryce decides that that is where the information that they need to find out is. So they have this plan to go and infiltrate this spot. Now Rune ends up telling Agent Daybright over his like mind communication what their plan is and she says do not go and then she says dungeons and screams. So now Rune is very concerned that Agent Daybright has been captured and is also being held in the dungeons where they are going. So Rune, Hunt, and Bryce make their way, and Bryce ends up finding out that the Asteri are just these galactic leeches that go to different planets and suck out the light from the inhabitants. And there are all these different planets that say conquered, conquered this state, conquered this state, the children tasted great, the children were great fuel, had to leave this planet. Now there was a planet that was able to kick the Asteri out. I'm thinking it's Rasan and all of them's planet. However, um, so there was a planet that was able to kick them out, and also Hell was able to kick them out. So there have been some realms or planets that have been able to stop the Asteri, but for the most part, the Asteri are just these horrible leeches that are creating these people, actually bringing species from other realms into Crescent City. That's where they all started, and Danica was the one who kind of realized that when she was trying to look at ancestries, bringing them into this realm and harvesting their light to eat and power themselves up. So that is a big, big thing for Bryce to find out, and she is utterly shocked, and she walks out of that room white-faced like everybody else. Unfortunately, right after this, Hunt is captured. He's actually, when she walks out of that room, she sees that Hunt is in chains. Um, so she is captured, Hunt is captured, and Rude is captured by the Harpy and taken to the dungeons, awaiting the Asteri. Now, the Harpy has a knife, and she is about to start torturing Rude with it. However... In walks the hind, and the hind attacks the harpy, and then Rune is like, oh my gosh, I recognize that scent. She kind of smells like me, because they had had sex in their, like, mind area. And it turns out that the hind is actually Agent Daybright, and Lydia and Rune have this, like, moment where they recognize each other, and the hind attacks and kills the harpy with Rune's help, and then they hear people uh, coming. So the hind says, you have to make it look like I didn't help you, so Bryce pretty much beats the shit out of her, and then they are captured again and brought to the Asteri. Now, while they are walking, the Hind is trying to talk to Rune telepathically, and Rune has created these black adamant walls and is like, I am so mad at her because she lied to me and she killed Sophie and she killed all of these people. We also find out that the Hind actually is the one that sent the beacon to help Sophie. So she dropped a crystal into the water, hoping that those people on that ship that we talked about earlier would come and rescue Sophie before she drowned. Unfortunately, they didn't get there in time. So it wasn't Sophie using her Thunderbird ability, it was the Hind trying to save Sophie before she drowned. Unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. So the Hind, we find out, is actually good and has been working to help them. However, she also has done some horrible things along the way. So, they are brought in front of Regulus and the Astari. So Rune, Bryce, and Hunt are taken to the Astari, and they're actually in the same room where Hunt had his wings taken off. So this is a very traumatic place for Hunt to be. And the one of the Astari named Regulus tells Bryce that they actually have been trying to use Bryce in order to open up a realm to get back to that planet or that realm that kicked them out the first time, which I believe is actually Rosanne's planet. And that star on her chest that glows is supposed to glow anytime they are, she's around somebody that has undiluted fey blood, like Cormac, because it actually glowed in Cormac's presence. It also seems to glow when she is like feeling strong emotions, but they didn't really get into that. So we also find out that Rigelis actually pretended to be Aedius, the Prince of the Pit, earlier in the book, and was trying to get Bryce to train with to train and join the Orphean Rebels so that way she'd be able to use her power and they would be able to use her to open a realm into that realm that kicked the Asteri out because the Asteri want revenge. So that is why they've kind of been letting Bryce live because they need to use her power in order to open up this portal to a realm. Now Bryce is like, yeah, I don't want to do that. So at first Bryce is like, hey, if you don't hurt my friends, I will open this realm for you. But Regulus or Regulus is like, yeah, no. Um, we're just going to use your power, your food to us, your like lesser beings, whatever. 
Anyway, somehow Bryce is able to winnow, even though there are awards, slowly to this portal and she is able to get out and makes it into another world. She believes she is going to hell. However, when she drops down, it turns out it is not hell at all. We know what it, or how it ends because hopefully you guys read this book. She actually drops down into the world of Akatar. So I believe it's actually Azrael who finds her first, brings her back to the cottage where we see Amran. Amran is shocked because she is speaking a language that has not been spoken for thousands of years and only Amran understands her. And that is when Rhysand walks in and we get that last line, Hello, Bryce Quinlan. My name is Rhysand. So I literally lost my shit the first time I read this book. Like, I just sat in silence and then did, like, zoomies around my house. So I was not expecting a multiverse at all. I'm, I'm still amazed that SJM went that route. But there are so many theories and speculations. So my recap is not done. That is just the plot. And now I'm going to go through the history and then I'm gonna end with some of my theories with what I think is gonna happen in House of Flame and Shadow. And something very important I forgot to mention is that when Bryce ends up going to Prithian or falls into Prithian, she ends up seeing Azrael's sword and it turns out that Truth Teller and the Star Sword are both glowing and seem to be identical. So they seem to be like sister swords, which is gonna probably be very important when I get to my theory section. And then on top of that, when Hunt, or when Bryce is able to escape, there's a scene where Hunt is taken by Pollux and you think Pollux is gonna kill him by snapping his neck, but instead he just holds his head and then Rigelus ends up putting the slave tattoo back on Hunt's brow, which was unbelievably upsetting. So I am so looking forward to House of Flame and Shadow. I'm trying to emotionally prepare myself because she already said this is gonna be a very uh, emotionally devastating book. So she was talking about death and things like that, so I'm very, very worried. But yeah, I just, I cannot wait for this next book to be released. All right, so let's get into the history of the Asteri. So earlier in this book, Rigelus, who's disguised as Aetius, tells Bryce about what actually happened between Queen Thea Peleus and Helena, her daughter. So up until now, everyone believed that there was Queen Thea, who was powerful. She went up against the Asteri. She was a Thay. And her daughter, she had two daughters. One of them, we don't exactly know what happened to. The other one was Helena. Now, she was the starborn daughter and was said to possess a lot of power. Now, everyone believed there was a love match between Helena and Peleus, but it turns out that Peleus was actually Helena's general and forced this marriage in order for Peleus to secure more power. And Peleus is actually the one who ended up killing Queen Thea. Now, when Bryce says, why does everyone believe this different narrative? Aetius says, well, the Asari rule, so they're able to create this narrative. Now, Bryce doesn't realize she's actually talking to an Asari during all of this, but that's another point. So anyway, we have to figure out exactly what happened. Also, up until now, Bryce and all of them have believed that Hell is actually working against them and that Hell is gonna send these monsters to kill everyone in Crescent City. Turns out that Apollyon, also known as the Star Eater who ate in Asteri, is actually trying to help. He went up against Peleus in order to protect Queen or Princess Helena, the starboard heir. All of that to say that Hell is really going up against the Asteri as well, which is very important. So we have a bunch of different realms that are trying to kill these parasitic beings from taking the First Light, i.e. souls, from all of these creatures. All right, so now let's get into some theories and speculations. So one, I forget exactly where it is in the book, but one of, I believe it's Rigelus, talks about the different types of fae. And he talks about there being fae that could transform into animals and then other fae with like pointed ears. So I believe that one of the fae is the fae from Throne of Glass, like the Rowan fae, and the other fae is the fae like Rhysand and Vera and the High fae. Also, there is talk about using these gates to bring in different species from these different realms, which is obviously how all of these people ended up in Crescent City. Now, I'm trying to figure out how Amryn fits in because she obviously knows this language, but what is she in relation to all of these other beings? Like, I don't believe she was an Asari, but was she one of those people that went up against the Asari? Or like, was she one of the creatures of hell? Where does she fall in all of this? So I'm very curious of that. Also, it was, I was so excited when I did my theories video. I actually had a video just for theories when I first started my booktube channel. 
and I talked about how Truth Teller had to be related to the Star Sword because when they talked about the Star Sword originally, they were saying how there was a dagger that was similar, that they were always together. So I like automatically thought Truth Teller. So somehow they are gonna have to play a role. Also, how is it that Rune and Resand resemble each other so much? And the fact that Rune has this Damati ability. So is it that Rune is somehow descended from that Fey line? Also, I'm pretty sure there's a missing princess, the daughter of Thea. How did she relate? Like, did she stay in Prithian? And that's how all of that went into effect. And also we have to think back to Silver Flames because there is the, I forget the name of the creatures. I always butcher them when I try to say them, but there are these big bad creatures that created these objects that are like evil objects. Are they related to the Asteri? I'm pretty sure the Asteri and them are like the same type of being. So also, where's the dust court? That has to appear somewhere. I'm pretty sure it's where the bone carver was held. Um, I think that's gonna come into play. So I have, I have so many questions and speculations. I'm honestly exhausted, you guys, which is why I'm not going in depth into all of my theories. I might make a separate like theory video when it gets closer to release day. But yeah, tell me, what do you guys think? Also, I am sure I miss points in this book, so please feel free to leave a comment down below if there's anything really relevant that I forgot to mention in this video. And yeah, so I would like to say a huge thank you to my patrons. So Amanda and Erin, thank you guys, my paladin protectors, and also everyone else who has subscribed to my Patreon. And I said this already, I post new videos every Wednesday and Sunday. And if you haven't yet, please like and subscribe. I will see you all next week. Bye.